Okay, so this is where we start looking at something a little bit complicated, more complex than what we looked at earlier. So now we are looking at the section entity type. And we know from our ER diagram that section is connected to both course and semester. And we are showing only both of those because those are the entity types from which it borrows keys because of key migration and it has, you know, it gets foreign keys from them. So that's why we are showing only those two. Uh, so from this, we can see that section has actually three plus two, five entity, uh, five attributes. So we are seeing all of those attributes here. Section name, days of the week, start time, semester ID, course ID. You also see the days of the week and start time are optional attributes. So notice there's no not null here. So null values are allowed for those two things, but not for the remaining three. Okay, so that's why you see these columns in the section table. That is straightforward. What about the primary key for section? So once again, the primary key is created in exactly the same way. Alter table, section, add, constraint, straightforward. Section PK is just the name they're giving for the primary key. And then we are saying we are defining a primary key and the fields in the primary key are section name, course ID, semester ID. We've already seen this, right? Because a section has the key migrations and it's got its own key here as well, okay? And it's got these two. Therefore, we know that the primary key is course ID plus section name plus semester ID. And that's exactly what the data modeler has generated. Again, we now look at allocation, which is the allocation of an instructor to section. Pretty much the same thing. Allocation, as we can see, has uh, three, uh, you know, one attribute of its own, plus the other attributes that come in because of these, uh, because of the one-to-many relationships. And those attributes will be the whole primary key of section, which is course ID, section name, semester ID. Okay, so course ID, section name, semester ID, all of them have come in. Plus the instructor ID is also coming in from the instructor, so you see instructor ID. So percentage load is the only attribute it has of its own. And of course, it turns out that because these two lines are solid, all of the attributes that it borrows are required attributes. Of course, all of those attributes are also part of its primary key, so they become required as well. Okay, so uh, everything is all the attributes are required attributes. What about the primary key? As we've already said, it's the primary key of section, which itself has course ID, section name, semester ID. So section name, course ID, semester ID, plus instructor ID, so you've got that. Okay, similarly, if you look at registration, same idea. Okay, registration is going to have the primary key of section and student. Section itself, we already know, is course ID, section name, student ID. Uh, course ID, section name, semester ID. So course ID, section name, semester ID, plus grade, which is an optional attribute. So there's no not null here. And registration date is a date. It's a not null attribute. So that's what it is. Okay. Once again, I remind you, how did the system figure out that this is a date and this is an integer? And that's a where I'll show that to you in a hands-on exercise. We need to do something extra inside of data modeler to get it to generate all of these things correctly. So once again, you can verify that the, that the primary key that is generated for the registration table is good. Okay, we are almost done. It looks like we are done. We've generated all the tables. We've got all the you know, primary keys done. So it looks like we are done, but in reality, we're not completely done. Okay, once again, this is just, I'm going to show you some more code that Oracle Data Modeler has generated but you need to understand it. Okay, so now we've got, we've, we already know that when there's a one-to-many relationship, the primary key of the entity on the one side becomes the foreign key of the entity on the many side. We know that, okay? We're just saying foreign key, but that again is a constraint. Now, why do we say foreign key is a constraint? Now, consider the example of the course ID inside the section table. Okay, in other words, suppose you're offering a particular section and you're saying this is a section of this particular course. Okay, now obviously you cannot have a section of a course that doesn't exist. Okay, so in order for a course ID to appear in the section table, 
that course ID must exist in the course table. Otherwise, that section is a meaningless section. Okay? You're saying I'm offering a section of a course, but the course itself doesn't exist. That completely is nonsense. Okay? Now, why would somebody go and enter something like that? Why would that ever happen? Well, in a database situation, people are entering data by hand. It's always possible that mistakes can occur. Okay? So you want to tell the database, look, don't allow, just like the primary key constraint says, don't allow a duplicate value for the primary key. If by any chance somebody enters a duplicate value, reject it. Okay? So once you specify the constraint, the database system is going to automatically enforce it. So you prevent errors from happening. Similarly, you want to prevent invalid foreign keys from getting into the database. So you specify a foreign key constraint that tells the database system, look, under no condition should you allow a course ID to get into the section table if that course ID doesn't even exist in the course table. Okay, that's the idea here. So that is why foreign keys are also specified as constraints. And, you know, the reason again is there's no point in allowing non-existent values to get into the database. Here, the way the foreign key code looks like in, uh, in databases is, is like this. We are saying here, in section, we cannot allow a course ID that does, doesn't exist in the course table, right? So we are saying, alter table section. We already know this. We are saying, I have already defined the table section. I have already given it a primary key. But you know what? There is a field out there which is a foreign key. And I want to let you know about this. That's what we are telling the database system. So alter the table section. Add another constraint. This time... It is, they're calling the constraint a section course FK, foreign key. This is just a name. You can ignore it for now. But we are saying what we are adding is a foreign key. Earlier we said what we are adding is a primary key. Now we are saying it's a foreign key that we are adding. And which is the foreign, the foreign key in the section table? Well, you know what? The field called course ID in the section table is a foreign key. And incidentally, it references course ID from the course table. Okay. In other words, don't allow anybody to add a course ID value in the section table unless the course ID value exists as a value in the course table. In any row, it doesn't matter. Somewhere in the course table, in the course ID column, the value must exist to say that this course really exists. Then you can have a section of that course. That's exactly what you're saying in this constraint. And again, this constraint was automatically generated by the system based on our cardinality values. Okay? So again, we saw that. Create a foreign key, which is the course ID in the section table, must be a valid course ID value in the course table. That's really the information that is contained in that text. Okay? So that's just one foreign key. And the beauty about constraints is we create constraints so that we can exploit the power of database systems to automatically enforce the constraints. So if you say something is a primary key, the database system will not allow anybody to, even by mistake, enter wrong values, enter duplicate values. Okay, if somebody makes a mistake, it will reject it, say, sorry, I can't take this. Okay, it's a constraint, it cannot be violated. Okay, and what that does is, it maintains the integrity of the database. Okay, otherwise, if the system doesn't enforce this, over time, the database will just become nonsense. All kinds of errors will be there, and when you're trying to run the system, when you're trying to look up the data, you'll get all sorts of errors. But once you define the constraints, you tell the database system, look, these are rules, enforce them. And of course, it's a machine. It will blindly enforce the rules. Okay? So constraints maintain database integrity, and therefore, these are also called integrity constraints. Primary key constraints, foreign key constraints are two types of integrity constraints. Okay, so primary constra key constraints enforce entity integrity and foreign key constraints enforce what is called as referential integrity. In other words, this value is referring to a value in the, the course ID in the, co in the section table is referencing the course ID from the courses table. Okay, it should not be allowed to reference a non-existent value. So that is what is called 
referential integrity. Okay, so primary key constraints and foreign key constraints enforce database integrity. Here I'm just showing you the various other uh, foreign key referential integrity constraints. For example, it's saying in the table allocation, the instructor ID must be a valid value from the instructor table, from the instructor ID field of the instructor table. In the table allocation, the uh, section name, uh, course ID, semester ID, uh, that combination must be a co the correct value from the section table, right? The combination and so on and so on. Okay, there are some errors in some of these, but don't worry about them for now. Okay, so that really completes our discussion of database design. Now, be sure to take a look at the hands-on exercise that I've posted that has absolutely crucial information for you to go through this entire life cycle of creating an ER diagram. In fact, you'll do something before creating the ER diagram to enable the system to actually generate a complete database uh, definition. Okay, so there's something you need to learn for that and that I'll explain in my hands-on exercise. So you need to look at that and then we learn how to draw the ER diagram for a new business situation. That's part of the hands-on exercise again. And after you do that, I'll show you how to take that and convert it into a database script. Okay, and then after that, all you have to do is to run the database script on a database and have the database. Unfortunately, the script that is generated is for an Oracle database so you will not be able to run that script on a MySQL database, okay? But the following week, the next week, we'll actually learn how to take that and put it into an Oracle database and start writing our complete web applications. In other words, next week or after the exam, or no, actually even before the exam because I've moved the exam by a week, next week, we'll take a look at how to take this database that we have designed and actually create a running application. In other words, what we'll do is we'll go back and fill up the bottom part of the diagram that we've been looking at.